So hey, Andrew, it's Nam. Uh, we're in this <laughs> little tent, um, and you've got some uh, new modules to show off, right? We have three very exciting new modules this year. One is the Nebula V2. We can start with right here. We've added a lot of functionality. We took basically the most common requests from users and tried to add as many as we could, or at least the ones we heard most often. So live audio input, which is a huge thing, stereo inputs and outputs, improved granular section, and substantially improved audio fidelity, which was a huge thing. So along the top here, we have our same controls as the original Nebulae, start and size. Set the size of your loop. Start with the through it. Independent pitch and speed, so you move one, it doesn't affect the other. You can go four times as fast in either direction. As you move past the center point, the file becomes starts playing back in reverse. If you want to get back to your normal speed, you just hit the encoder. And on speed, you can actually swap between forward and reverse just by hitting the encoder. Beneath that, we have our pitch control. It goes two octaves up and three octaves below the normal pitch. And then the same thing, you just press the encoder, it goes back to your normal pitch. Really useful if you want to keep things in tune with everything else in your patch. In addition, there's a Volper octave for the pitch control, which covers the entire range. Perfect tracking. Next to that, we have our pulse output. This is just a gate that spits out at the end of the, once it's reached the end of the loop. So every time the reset button lights up, it's outputting a gate signal that you can use to synchronize all the other things in your patch to the nebulae, so it doesn't stand on its own anymore. And then underneath that, we have our granular section. So as we turn up the blend control, this sets your dry wet between the granular and the dry audio signal. We have density and overlap. Density is essentially our, our grain rate. Overlap sets the size of each grain. So you turn down to just little clicks. As it gets larger, the grains start to overlap, which was also something missing from the original Nebulae. And then we added a really fun window control. So this sets the grain shape of the granular section. So we have panning, Gaussian, and a couple that we made up ourselves. Completely different beast than the original Nebulae, as far as the granular goes. So, and, uh, so what is the uh, audio fidelity uh, recording into and, and how well? So it's currently 24-bit, 48k sample rate. Once we cram all the features in there, the last minute things that we're going to be adding, we're going to try and bump it up to 96k, but for the time being it's 48. We're going to see how, how much we can cram in there. So, and uh, do we have a price uh, kind of point and uh, time? We do. On that? So it's going to be available early March. It's going to MSRP for 429, the exact same as the original Nebulae, with a lot of added functionality. Excellent. So, um, yeah. So what else have we got then? So, along the bottom, we have our button controls. Next, just sw skips through all of your files. Reset's going to recall the start point of your loop, right? So if we pull this up here. And then freeze just freezes the audio right where it is and keeps the pitch and the timbre the same. The source button switches between our file playback from the USB stick and our live audio input. So if we go here, right now we have a chord patch coming in. This is live. I'm going to hit record. It's got a five minute stereo buffer, so an extremely long recording time. Once I hit record again, it's looping our audio now. So this is our recorded buffer. All of our controls act the same. Pitch and speed still. Granular controls are still happening. You can freeze it, reset it, just a little start in size. And then still switch between your file playback or your live audio input. And that's the next.
Simulate. We're also going to be supporting the alternate firmware functionality that we had in the original. It's going to support pure data, C sound, and super collider files in addition to just bare bones C programs for those that want to go there. We're going to create pretty much a wealth of information about getting going, writing your own code, making your own instruments, and we're going to make it a lot easier than it was before. So instead of just a template file, all you have to do is a little tiny instrument, eight lines of code, and you have something up and running. We're going to hide all of the nuts and bolts of accessing the CV and the um, ADC reads and the pots and, and what have you so that you, the users don't have to worry about it. They can of course go there if they want. All the code is going to be open source, accessible, so you can go as deep as you want, but we're going to make it so that you don't have to go deep if you don't want to. And that's the Nebula. So uh, next we've got this uh, scan, right? Is that a new one? That is correct. So the scan is an organic wavetable VCO. So we should get it back to a normal setting here. So it uses a technique called scan synthesis. This is a synthesis method generated, pioneered by Max Matthews in the 90s. And it's really interesting because it's actually virtually unexplored. It's, you don't hear it in any music, you don't hear it, you don't really see it in a lot of hardware or software implementations, and actually it's never existed on hardware until this very moment. Primarily I think because the processing power required has really just not been there for microprocessors. And we're finally at that stage where we have little systems on a chip that can run fast enough to support this powerful synthesis technique. So the way it works is it generates wavetables on the fly, it's constantly updating them and generating them in response to this string model interface. So it uses the metaphor of a string, not in the sense of physical modeling, but just as a way to set the controls and create an interface for interacting with this wavetable. So you'll see things like mass, center, stiffness. These are just environmental factors that are controlling the way this string would be moving through time. So along the top we have our hammer section, shape and position. This is the thing that's exciting the string. So the shape is basically the shape of your plectrum, the thing that's exciting it. The position is going to be where at along the string it's actually causing it to vibrate. Strength is the amplitude of what's causing it to, to vibrate, to, to excite the string. At the top we have our standard VCO controls, coarse frequency and fine. Now the really unique thing about this VCO is that once you touch a control, it'll take anywhere from 3 seconds to 30 minutes before it settles back into a consistent repeating pattern, if it does at all crazy, every time I touch this I, come up, I hear sounds I've never even heard before anywhere, let alone just out of this unit. So best way to show that, let me just turn dampening up and you see I haven't moved the knob and it's been 10 seconds but the sound continues to evolve and, and expand upon what it had prior. Bring up stiffness, it's going to introduce some noise elements. get it just right, the string will actually stop vibrating. If we turn up stiffness, turn down dampening, and then bring strength down, the sound's going to die away. Now we can manually excite the string, sort of like an internal VCA, if you will. All the controls are still affecting our timbre, our decay, etc. And what's even better than that is we can use a gate signal. We'll grab this here from our octone. we have the beginnings of a full voice with a single unit. You can send a sequence to it. It has perfect volt per, active, volt per octave tracking across the whole range. No external filters, no external VCAs here. It's just a whole voice coming from a single module. It looks like you've got a CV over kind of all the all the all the controls. Well. Exactly. Every control has CV, and in addition, you can actually send an audio input to excite the string instead of using the onboard controls. So you can send the output of a nebula or any other oscillator to the input here, adjust the level, and it's going to excite the string in relation to that, sort of like an envelope follower generating CV. Excellent. And so the scan will be available in May, and it's going to be 349 MSRP. And uh, 
One more module? Uh, yes, we have the Synapse. So let me just pull this up here. So the Synapse is a cross-fading switch module. Eight inputs along the top, seven unique outputs along the bottom. So the way it works is each succeed, two subsequent inputs cascade down into a single channel. So the way it works, we have eight inputs, four channels, and then the cross-fading circuit for each channel lets you smoothly morph between the two sounds that are on that channel. There's a CV input for that as well, and the LED color shows you which signal you're listening to at the time. We're using 2164 VCA chips, so there's extremely low distortion, high quality VCA crossfading. And if you look along the bottom, you'll see that each LED's color matches one along our individual outputs here. So this is just the individual outs for each of the four channels and the colors tell you which one's going to where. So now why that matters is we have a terminal encoder here and as you turn it, you can shift all of your inputs to different outputs. You can shift it right, shift it left. It's completely clickless switching. We're using zero crossing detection to eliminate all the clicks and pops you would normally hear on a switch. And then next to that there's a scatter button which just sends them to random outputs. If you get sick of where it went or it's not where you wanted to go, you just press the terminal and everything goes back to normal. All the channels line up in a vertical orientation again. Along the bottom we have our sum outputs. Channels one and two are summed post switch, so as you change it, these two channels will change on the sum output. Channels three and four, it's the same thing, and then the sum output, which gives you all channels summed together. So a lot of unique outputs and really useful for just mixing and routing, of course. We also have a memory section, which gives us eight unique memory slots that we can store and recall the crossfade positions of the VCAs. So the way this works, as you turn memory, you'll see the LED for that particular slot start to blink. So you have eight slots. If you go to this slot, set your VCAs somewhere. Let's say we want, we want to save this sound right here. Hit save, it's going to blink to tell you that it's saved. Then we can go here. Let's pull the noise down. Hit save again. Oh, I moved it, of course. So now, as we move through the memory locations, it's recalling what we already saved. So if you don't want the abrupt change, you can pull up the inertia knob, and you hear it start to morph between the positions. So it just adds a crossfade between all the memory slots, which is really useful. Then the last functionality that's sort of hidden is the internal LFO modulation. So turn all these down. When you hold the terminal encoder and adjust one of these knobs, you set the amount of modulation on an internal LFO. So you see the crossfade moving on its own now. We can do the same for each channel. They're out of phase with each other. So each crossfade circuit is going up and down with an internal LFO and the rate of that LFO is controlled with the inertia knob. saves you from needing any additional modulation um, sources. So you, once you get a little slow, you get really nice evolving textures just right off the bat. Plug in eight sound sources and it just starts to make these cascading textures of sound. So, uh, again, the same old question. Uh, <laughs> When and, uh, and how much? It'll be available in June. It's going to MSRP for three thirty-nine. Excellent. Yeah. So thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for stopping by.